Hello everyone, this is Era Felon, and with my Zeuxis World playthrough coming to a conclusion, I'm gearing up for a new playthrough, this time of something called Gekijo Ban Magikaru Buringa Corona. Uh, it's a version I've personally translated. The translation's kind of old, but it's still pretty good. Anyway, that roughly translates to Magical Bringer Corona the Movie, or Corona 2 for short. Anyway, for the benefit of anyone not familiar with the first game, which is probably pretty much everyone watching, I thought I'd try summarizing what happens there, and also give an introduction to what the games are to begin with. Magical Bringer Corona is an anime-inspired Japanese indie game that I stumbled across a while ago. It and its sequel were produced by Sanda Boruto, uh, Thunderbolt, they normally romanize it with an S as Thunderbolt, in any case. Uh, the group seems to have vanished off the face of the internet since then, and I don't think there was ever a third game, which is kind of disappointing because there was sort of a sequel hook at the end, but okay. The game patterns itself after a TV series, complete with episode names, cut-ins where commercial breaks would go, intro and outro animations with theme songs with vocals that repeat at the beginning of end of each chapter. However, unlike any typical anime, the storyline eventually splits into three diverging routes. Both Corona games are written in a scripting language for visual novels, called Enscriptor, but they managed to include a combat system vaguely similar to a rhythm game, even though the engine was never meant to do anything even remotely like that. They even have a sliding difficulty scale, based on your performance, that doubles as a score when you clear the game. And your final score additionally acts to unlock maximum difficulty settings and some of the fighters in free battle mode, which is where you can refight opponents with your choice of player character and difficulty setting, so a high score is good for more than just bragging rights. Also, the soundtrack is unexpectedly amazing. I'd like to give a quick shout out here to Yu Furka, the composer, known as Furuyama at the time. They're the creator of a sizable library of professional quality RPG-oriented free music. You can find their website at wenglish-serif.net. Also to Heart Sound, that's sound.jp slash heart underscore sound, who did the vocals for the opening and ending themes, and also the opening theme of the second game. Anything that pushes the limits of its engine like that tends to fascinate me, so at some point I went through the code, got an idea of how it works, and eventually that led to attempting to translate both Magical Bringer Corona and the sequel. Partly because the original includes a number of H scenes, and partly because it's just not as polished as the sequel, I'm not currently planning on doing a proper playthrough of the first game, even with the troublesome scenes edited out. However, it is still important backstory for the sequel, so let's go! The story begins with Corona Sakura, a rather childish 11th grade girl, late at night in her pajamas in her bedroom, attempting a summoning ritual she found in a book that her frequently traveling archaeologist father sent her from Turkey. Corona is the sort of character who is enthusiastic, friendly, and cheerful, but to be perfectly honest, she doesn't have much else going for her. She's not terribly athletic, she doesn't get good grades, she's really not responsible, and doesn't really have any other special skills worth noting. In short, Corona is someone who could raise your spirits and would be fun to hang out with, and that's great, but you wouldn't expect much out of her in a crisis situation. Also, she's flat as a washboard, which is just about the only trait of hers that seems to bother her at all. I wouldn't have mentioned that, but it's kind of a running gag. Corona has always dreamed of becoming a magical girl, and after some miscues, she actually manages to summon the Black Demon Sword, a massive ten-foot weapon that speaks in a deep menacing voice. He offers her power, she names him a Cirrus to form a pact, he psychically bonds with her, and boom, magic. Which doesn't come without its complications. Osiris talks with her in her head and shares her senses. Aside from the obvious general awkwardness that can cause it, also turns out that her favorite sweets also make him nauseous. She has trouble adjusting to her newfound powers at first, too, resulting in some cartoonish antics at school the next day, like resuscitating the frog she's supposed to be dissecting. This sudden change in Corona is especially concerning to her best friend, Yuka Amanogawa. 
Yuka is in many ways Kurina's complete opposite. She's calm and confident, physically fit, does well in school, and is well-rounded in uh, more ways than one. Which Kurina tries with limited success not to be too jealous of. However, the two of them are quite close and have been friends since childhood. Kurina's not sure what to tell her though, and just makes up an excuse. Near the train station on her way home, Corona spots a group of three strange-looking people. Turns out they're demons, and the cute little one, Noelle de Belzebeth, is actually their leader, a pureblood about five times Corona's age despite her appearance, and the most powerful of the three. And she wants a Cirrus for herself. That's bad news for Corona. Not only would losing a Cirrus mean no more magic, but now that he's bonded with her, breaking that bond would leave her coatose, at best. Nyaura Totep, the flippant cat-like one, attacks first, and Corona beats her without too much difficulty, banishing her back to the demon realm. Noelle, intrigued, goes next, and although Corona is initially badly outmatched, Osiris manages to muster up enough reserve energy to supercharge Corona and take Noelle by surprise. Seeing Noelle fall shakes Krom Kurek, the normally stoic dog-like one, enough that she attacks relentlessly, and Corona is able to handle her too. Unfortunately, Osiris won't be able to call up that much power again anytime soon, and the battle wrecked the train station besides. Things get worse when Lightning Angel Playa, a magical girl with a no-nonsense attitude, flies in to demand answers. Excited as Corona is to find out that there's another magical girl around, this is more of a running away very quickly situation. So, of course, Corona runs into her at school. Subaru Yoshiyumi is the 10th grade class president, highly organized and polite, independent to a fault, seemingly perfect at everything, and play as true identity. She confronts Corona on the school roof, but decides to tentatively accept her explanation of what happened, provided that she doesn't damage the city any further. So, of course, Nyao attacks Corona on the way home, and although Corona wins again, the neighborhood takes something of a beating. Playa arrives and demands to battle Corona, in the sky to avoid causing further property damage. She's quick, but not particularly durable, and Corona fends her off. However, all these battles are taking a lot out of her. Running short of magic is getting to be a problem, and it turns out that a bit of hanky-panky is the quickest and easiest way to address it. Ideally with someone else who has as much magical potential as possible, but solo activities will do in a pinch. And oddly enough, how this plays out determines the course of the remainder of the story. If Corona finds out about her energy problem, but does not follow through with dealing with it, she feels a bit off at school the next day and hits critical state during gym class. Yuka takes her to the infirmary, where Corona blurts out an incoherent version of the situation, and instead of reacting with confusion, Yuka almost seems to have expected something like this. She, um, lends a helping hand. And Corona recovers, but dozes off without explaining anything. After school, Nyal tries to run Corona down with a motorcycle, and Corona lures her to a remote location before engaging. Nyal has a new trick that involves hiding Corona's blind spot this time, but Osiris can negate that by temporarily turning into an energy cannon and striking from a distance, so okay, sure. But after the battle, Corona belatedly realizes that this secluded area is right near the shrine where Yuka lives. And Yuka is there, watching her. Panicking, Corona runs away. The next day, Corona works up her nerve to go visit Yuka and confesses everything that's happened. But Yuka has a confession of her own to make. She has had magic all along, and has felt guilty about hiding it from Corona all this time. They tearfully apologize to each other, and with everything out in the open, the relationship is strengthened and renewed. Later in the day, Yuka approaches Corona in the city, but something seems off about her. Then the real Yuka interrupts, using her Miko powers to dispel the illusion and reveal that the other Yuka was actually Krom in disguise, attempting an ambush. After Corona beats Krom in a fair fight, Yuka offers to provide support in future battles. Corona ends up staying with Yuka for the weekend. She learns about the shrine's holy relics, including charms, the Genbu mirror So Getz, and the exercising sword Gario. With these relics, Yuka is able to hear Osiris' voice, and the two of them get along remarkably well. Together, the group comes up with a plan to complement Corona's raw offensive ability with Yuka's defensive powers. 
Meanwhile, Yell and Krom are lurking nearby, but they can't get into the shrine's word of grounds, which gives Corona and Yuka time to prepare and recharge magic energy together. Once they're ready, they come out for a confrontation. Yell and Krom attack as a team, but with Yuka's help, Corona gets a significant edge in durability and can even reflect some of their damage back at them. Their victory celebration is cut short when Noelle appears, but she isn't interested in fighting while they're tired out. Instead, she promises to return the next day for one final battle. That night, they're discussing Yuka's relics and how they're over a thousand years old, when Asiris, unimpressed, chimes in that he was created 12,000 years ago. The ancient land of Mu used its finest magic and technology in forging him as a weapon to wage war against the gods themselves, but the civilization was obliterated before he could be used. When Noel arrives the next day, Yuka uses Guardio to cleave open a pocket dimension where they can fight without damaging the surroundings, then shields Corona again. Noel merely seems mildly amused by all this. The ensuing battle remains a challenge, but with Yuka's help, Corona and Osiris are able to prevail, and Noel withdraws as promised. However, Yuka can't get them out of the pocket dimension afterwards. It turns out that Guardio has some degree of sentience and has deemed Osiris an enemy of peace and harmony, so possesses Yuka in a bid to destroy him. Corona is forced to fight her, but insists that Osiris attack only the sword. After a long, grueling battle against an exceptionally tanky opponent with some surprisingly nasty tricks on offense besides, Corona emerges triumphant. Guardio breaks into shards, leaving Yuka safe and free from possession, and the pocket dimension collapses harmlessly. Osiris even repairs Guardio in the end, though he leaves its bothersome personality out when he does so. The story concludes with a scene two weeks later where Corona drags Subaru along to watch Yuka perform ritual dance at a festival. The demons have kept their word and not returned, and everything is back to normal. But with three girls who all have mysterious powers in one place, it seems likely that Destiny will find them again before long. And that is the Yuka route. However, if Asiris helped Corona recover her magic reserves earlier, she gets to school sated but late, with her homework unfinished, and has a run-in with Subaru while standing out in the hall. They fight above the rooftop after school, and despite Playa's determination to win, she still can't do it and flies off unsteadily again. Playa runs into Nyal after that, but Corona, who couldn't leave well enough alone and follow her, cuts in and fights Nyal off. It's the same battle as on the Yuka route, complete with the Bindstot trick and the energy cannon countermeasure. Later on, Krom shows up disguised as Yuka, and on this route gets close enough to graze Corona with a cursed knife that paralyzes her. Fortunately, Playa cuts in with a lightning strike, buying Corona time to recover enough to fight Krom off, though she suffers a strength penalty in this version of the battle. Playa then insists on fighting Corona herself again, and loses again despite having boosted her already superior speed even higher. However, Corona exhausts her magic energy in the fight, and instinctive hanky-panky ensues, which Pelea corroborates with rather than risk unleashing thirsty Corona on an unsuspecting public. Curiously though, Asiris observes afterwards that no more energy was recovered than would be expected from an ordinary human. In other words, Pelea has no magical power whatsoever. Subaru summons Corona to her apartment the next day, where her handsome young uncle Akira explains Playa's true nature. What appears to be magic is actually advanced nanotechnology. Even Osiris is impressed, liking it to alchemy. The technology was developed by Subaru's parents, who died in a plane crash ten years ago. She hasn't been the same since, insisting on doing everything herself and refusing to depend on anyone for anything, and Akira is worried about her. Lately, though, she's been singularly obsessed with Corona, which he thinks might just be the way to get through to her. And he just so happens to have business at the university, leaving Subaru to stay over at Corona's house for the night. As they're leaving, Yaw and Krom show up to attack again, and since they have a grudge against Subaru also, she agrees to join forces with Corona for the time being out of expediency. The combination provides a speed boost that automatically blocks attacks from one side, and powers up Corona's standard special attack with Playa's Lightning. They win, but Subaru remains mostly just annoyed with her. The next day, Noel appears to challenge Corona to one final battle. Subaru decides to help out again, not wanting to let anyone else beat Corona before she does, and insists that they fight over the ocean to avoid damaging anything. 
Noelle agrees, but Themes play a mere distraction and blasts her into the sea as soon as they arrive. Things aren't looking too good for Corona either, until Playa bursts out from underwater, hitting Noelle with an explosive lightning strike. Decomposing water into oxygen to breathe and hydrogen to detonate is a simple enough matter for the Pleiades system, and now Noelle is sufficiently intrigued that she allows Playa to participate. Together, the two of them prevail against Noelle. But Subaru still sees Corona as an enemy, an obstacle, something to be overcome, and demands to fight her once again. But the way Corona sees it, she's just afraid. Afraid of getting close enough to anyone that losing them would hurt her, afraid of needing anyone for anything, and also too stubborn for her own good. So Corona agrees to fight her, hoping to knock some sense into Subaru. In a dramatic battle under the full moon, Playa brings even more tricks to bear, including a unique new special attack designed to overwhelm your ability to keep track of what it's doing. But Corona ultimately prevails, intentionally whiffs on what would have been a finishing blow, then sets her for rails and starts to head home as though nothing out of the ordinary had happened. Then she remembers how late it is and how upset her mom is going to be, and she rushes back to drag Subaru home with her to help with apologizing instead. The story concludes some unspecified time later with Corona buying Choco Banana Crepes for herself and Subaru and Yuka. Subaru has mellowed somewhat, although she still doesn't quite trust Corona and still hasn't given up on finding a way to beat her, eventually. But she's more willing to work together in the meantime, and she even smiles briefly. There's also an alternate outcome in which Corona destroys the Pleiade system, forcing Subaru to live out her life without special powers, but it leads into a downer ending decades later with an unaging Corona mourning her death, and the sequel punts that entirely out of canon anyway, so never mind that. It's also possible for Osiris to skip telling Corona about his energy concerns altogether. In this case, Corona has an uneventful day until after school when, like on the Yuka route, Niall tries to run her down with a motorcycle. The ensuing battle goes much as on the other two routes, except that Osiris held back enough at the end to leave Njal still in the human world. Not having done anything to recover her magic energy on this route, Corona fiercely hungers after that fight, although she doesn't really understand what for. But her instincts take over, and an intense scene with Njal falls, ending in a tender kiss before she vanishes back into the demon realm. And that leaves Corona conflicted. She's realized that the demons are people too, not just heartless monsters. And she may have kind of fallen for Njal. Either way, she's lost her will to fight. Until Krom shows up disguised as Yuka as usual, and things really go off the rails. She tricks Corona into drinking a deadly poison, and although Corona tries to defend herself once she realizes what happened, she's severely weakened and struggles just to hear Osiris' voice. The ensuing battle is only barely winnable, and even winning barely results in finding out that the Krom she just fought was only an illusion. Things look grim until Corona suddenly gets back up, now with blonde hair and an attitude like an internet troll crossed with a Yandere in full-on gleeful violence mode. This Corona is somehow unaffected by the poison and smacks Krom around more for fun than anything else, though she holds back enough for Krom to remain in the human world to feed on later. So, what happened? With Corona unconscious and the situation desperate, Osiris basically unchained her id, the side of her that wants and demands and doesn't care about consequences, and let that take over. But this dark Corona has no intention of ever going back, so she stole away the bulk of Osiris' power, then shut him and the usual Corona away in her place. The situation should be hopeless, but Osiris entrusts Corona with the last of his power, risking his own continued existence to do so, which allows her to break out, rescue Krom, and confront Dark Corona. Our Corona is at a distinct disadvantage when the battle rivals any of the endgame bosses in difficulty, but losing is not an option. Dark Corona is ultimately recontained. However, the strain took a toll on Osiris, and he needs to go into hibernation to recover. He entrusts the entirety of his power to Corona in the meantime. On this path, when Yo and Krom challenge Corona again, they approach her openly as a sign of respect. Although she doesn't have Yuka or Player backing her up, the extra power boost from Osiris easily makes up for that. As they fade away, they express their hope to someday meet again, as comrades. But then, Corona's mother Mizuki arrives, sees her in her magical girl form, and promptly dies in front of a lamppost that was about to fall on her. Corona would have been fine, but Mizuki? Not so much. Player arrives to complain about the property damage, but upon seeing the situation, insists that Corona rush to a hospital instead. 
Mizuki knows it's too late for that, though, and asks to go home, where she slips away after an emotional scene. That's when Noelle appears, claiming to have the power to save her even now. Kurina fascinates her, it seems. No one else has ever been such a worthy opponent. Noelle has long become used to being the strongest, the highest, the greatest, and she's grown bored and, and lonely. So she offers to restore Mizuki to life and health if Corona can best her in an all-out battle with nothing held back. But they need to be quick about it. Once the sun rises here, it will be too late for even Noelle to save Mizuki. Corona hesitates, but she can't abandon her mother as long as there's any hope. Besides, Osiris believes in her, and even her dark side has her back in this. And so, they leave for an epic no-holds-barred battle in space where it won't bother anyone. Noelle isn't exactly kidding around on the other story paths, but it's only here that she unleashes her true power and her full moveset. On top of having high stats to begin with, Exceed Noelle adds an extra chaotic speed effect to both normal attack rounds and normal defense rounds, making her harder both to hit and to evade. She's also able to counter and completely nullify Corona's blaster attack, causing entire special attack rounds to go to waste. Only the fact that Corona fights her at enhanced strength keeps Exceed Noelle from completely overshadowing the other two final bosses. Even with all the power at her disposal, however, Corona still struggles and the sun begins to rise. Until finally, desperation gives rise to a new, especially dramatic, multi-part special attack, and that's just enough to give Corona a chance to scrape out a win. As promised, Noelle works her magic on Nizuki. Naturally, both Noelle and Corona are exhausted by this point and retire to recover magic together, which feels kind of skeevy, even if Noelle is the aggressor and canonically nearly a century old. When Corona wakes up the next day, Osiris has recovered, Mizuki has recovered, and Noelle is downstairs watching TV and having lunch. Well, Corona intrigues her, and she's realized she has much to learn, so she took the liberty of tweaking Mizuki's memory a bit. Not just to forget about the injury and all the magical girl stuff, but also to believe that Noelle was an exchange student from abroad. She'll be living with them until further notice. And that foreshadows further adventures even more than the other routes do. Although Corona 1 splits into three completely separate story paths, Corona 2 retcons all that into a single unified storyline where every major plot event, including Dark Corona and all three of the final battles, happened except for the alternate ending on the Superhero Path, and we don't really talk about the hanky-panky which the sequel dispenses with. Corona the Movie, which isn't actually a movie any more than Corona 1 is actually an anime, focuses more on improving on the battle system, expanding on the characterization and world building, introducing new people and places, and doing something interesting with the storyline that I'm not going to spoil here. Come back for the Corona 2 playthrough to find out more!